Turn your Bibles, if you will. We're going to start off in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And as you're turning there, why, didn't, why did Adam and Eve have an ideal marriage? Because Adam didn't have to hear about all the guys that Eve could have married, and Eve didn't have to hear about the way his mother cooked. Ideal marriage, amen? Last week, we began to consider some of the truths and also some of the falsehoods about our adversary, Satan. Amen? Many falsely believe that he doesn't exist, that he's just not real. They're more comfortable just accepting things as good and evil. They're more comfortable and prefer to remove the D from the devil and just call it evil and add an O to God and just call it good. But the Bible is very clear that Satan is a real person. Satan is very real and he has emotion, although it's wicked and evil. He also has an intellect. He's much more intelligent than you and I put together. And the Bible also shows us that he has a will. And his will is to exalt himself above God, above God's throne. So he is real. He is powerful. And he is out actively deceiving the entire world. Many also falsely believe that Satan is in hell. They, they believe that Satan's home is hell today. But that's just not true. The truth is that hell was created for Satan and his fallen angels, Satan and his demons. The Bible tells us that in the book of Matthew. But that's going to be his future home. It's not his home today. That's going to be his future home for eternity. Today, the Bible makes it very clear that he is freely roaming this earth. As the Bible says, as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Amen? He is the prince of this world. This world is his domain. This is this world system. That's why we see this world becoming more corrupt, more violent. It's his domain. Amen? It's his system in play. Also, many falsely believe that Satan, you know, looks like the, the cartoon, you know, depiction of himself. The, the red skin, the, the cloven tail, the, the, the horns on his head. Or they, they picture him as that gruesome Hollywood depiction of Satan. Although these images... You know, they would match his character for sure, no doubt about it. He prefers to appear as an angel of light. Satan would much rather appear beautiful, eye-catching, attractive, because his goal is to what? To scare us away? No, he wants to draw us in. He wants to lure us in. And last week, we considered... Satan's manners, the things that he does. We also considered his minions, the fallen angels, his demons, those unclean spirits. And this morning, I want us to consider Satan's motives. Satan's motives. Let's pick up in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and let's start reading at verse 1. Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly. And indeed, you do bear with me, for I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. For I consider that I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles. Again, this is the Apostle Paul. He's writing this letter to the church at Corinth. Verse 6, even though I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge. 
but we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. Did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to minister to you. And when I was present with you and in need, I was a burden to no one. For what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. And in everything, I kept myself from being burdensome to to you. And so I will keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no one shall stop me from this boasting in the regions of Acacia. Or Achaia. Why? Because I do not love you. Uh, because uh, God knows. Or, or he says, why? Because I do not love you. God knows that I do. But what I do, I will also continue to do. That I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are, just as the apostles are in the things of which they boast. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Amen? So the Apostle Paul is putting out this warning that Satan has many workers. Amen? Many active workers in this world. They appear to be apostles, apostles of Christ. They appear to be preachers of the gospel. But as he said, it's no wonder for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. So the question is, how can we recognize Satan when he is in disguise, when he is dressed to deceive? How do we know when he appears as an angel of light? Well, what we need to do is understand what he is up to. What are Satan's motives? Amen? And the first thing is that Satan tries to complicate the Bible. Satan tries to complicate the gospel message. Look at verse 3. Paul says, But I fear lest somehow, just as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, So your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. When we think about the Bible, when we we think about the gospel message, it is simple and it is un complicated. Amen? Understand that. The Bible and the gospel, they are very simple and they are very uncomplicated. We must protect ourselves from being deceived and led away from the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? God makes it simple. It's man that tries to convolute it, to make it complicated. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. Looking at verses 3, uh, starting at verse 3. A couple chapters to the right. Starting at verse 3. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. The Apostle Paul again, he says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Pretty simple, isn't it? That is the simple message of Jesus Christ. God came down in the flesh, born for one reason, and what was that? To die for us. Christ came, he died, he was buried, and the third day he rose from the dead, he was resurrected to his eternal glory. 
The Bible tells us that today, now he's seated at the right hand of God the Father to ever make intercession for us. Amen? The simplicity of Christ. That is a simple summation of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. Amen? He came. He died on Calvary. He was buried, and the third day, he was resurrected. Go to Romans chapter 5. Verse 6. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his love toward us. He proved his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen? While we were still sinners, Jesus is the author of peace. Amen? Not confusion. So Satan wants to complicate this simple message and he sends out his minions whether they be his demons bible calls them evil spirits unclean spirits they're fallen angels the one-third that he deceived he sends out his minions you know whether demons or just followers false teachers false apostles and they have false doctrines they have false beliefs And he raises up these false teachers to deceive as many as possible. Amen? So let's consider some of uh, Satan's uh, Satan's favorite ploys. Well, how does he do it? First, he complicates the gospel by taking away from it. Complicates the gospel by taking away from it. His favorite is to remove the blood from redemption. Amen? Amen? Remove the blood from redemption. There are several PC Bibles out there that have removed all references to the blood of Jesus Christ. His shedding of blood on Calvary's cross. These PC Bibles have removed every mention of it. I just want you to understand that PC means perfectly corrupt. Amen? Because that's what those Bibles are. But they're out there. The Bible is very clear and very simple. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of our sins. Amen? Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of our sins. The Bible makes that very, very clear. What else does he like to do? Well, he also likes to lie about Jesus' death on the cross. He, he sells the lie that, that Jesus didn't actually die. Jesus was, you know, just in a deep sleep. He was in a deep shock, but still alive. But the Bible and history make it very clear that Jesus gave up his spirit. He took his final breath, and he died on that cross. History tells us that the Roman soldiers did what? They took a spear and thrust it into his side just to make sure he was what? He was dead. Amen? What else does Satan do? Satan also tries to remove the authority of the Bible. He sows that the, the seeds of doubt that, that God is the author of the Bible. He sows the seed of doubt about its accuracy He confuses people by, you know, um, if you look in Bible bookstores again, not only are there those PC Bibles that take out the blood, but there's also a ton of Bibles that are paraphrase Bibles. You know what paraphrase means? I'm taking God's word and putting it in my own words. Why? Amen? God gave us his complete word and he made it very simple. Amen? The Bible was written, uh, you know, scholars have studied it, and, and, um, you know, unscholars have studied it, and everyone agrees it's written in about a third-grade language. 
third grade level, I mean. Very simple to understand. Amen? Maybe some of the names are not easy to pronounce, but the Bible itself is simple to understand. Third grade level. But Satan tries to, you know, he tries to remove the authority of the Bible. He has these different versions, these paraphrased Bibles out there. He wants us to doubt the word of God and the God of that word. Amen? That's his motive. But if you take the time to read it, if you take the time to, to actually study it, you're going to conclude that it is infallible, inerrant, it is perfect. There's not one contradiction from Genesis to, to Revelation, 66 books, a handful of different authors written over hundreds of years. In almost every continent, not one contradiction. It is inerrant, it is infallible, it is indeed God's holy and divine word without a shadow of a doubt. What else does Satan do? Well, not only does he complicate the gospel by adding to it, taking away from it, His favorite is to add good works to redemption. He likes to add good works to salvation. He deceives people in believing that they have to earn their way into heaven. He deceives people in, 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 in telling them that, that this is a must. You have to do this, this, and this to make it into heaven. Something that cannot be done. Amen? There is no way that we can earn our way into heaven. The Bible is very clear that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Plain and simple. Who did all the work? Christ did. Amen? All the work has already been done for us. Jesus did all the work on Calvary's cross. We are saved by God's good grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It's God's gift to us. It's a free gift. It's his free pardon of sin. And it's very simple. It's Jesus plus nothing. Amen? Even I can add that one up. Nothing else needs to be or can be added. So not only does he take away, but he also adds to the Bible. What else does he try to add? Well, not only does he try to add good works to salvation, but he likes to also add ceremonial requirements. He deceived the Jews in the Old Testament, if you read there, the, uh, uh, coming into the, into the New Testament. Christ preached to the multitudes. And after Christ died, was buried, was resurrected, after he ascended, you know, the disciples went out and they started to, to preach the gospel of Christ. But what did the Jews want to do? They wanted to hang on to what? Circumcision, right? The Jews believed that circumcision was a requirement to be right with God. That's adding to the gospel, amen? Today, what is it? Well, you have to be baptized or, or you have to be a church member. Show me where it says it. Amen. Those are the traditions, the ceremonies that, that Satan likes to add. And I'm not saying that either one is bad. Baptism is great and so is church membership. Amen. They're just not required. They're both outward expressions of what? Of inward change. They're outward declarations of the inward change that Christ did in my heart. A great example is the thief on the cross. Amen? Not the one that criticized and ridiculed, but the other thief. Who looked at Jesus and recognized who he was. And he said, Lord. Just that one word. 
says volumes, amen? He believed that Jesus, who was unrecognizable, battered beyond recognition, nailed to a cross, and he still called him what? Lord. And not only did he say, Lord, he said, but remember me when you come into your kingdom. He believed everything that Jesus said. He believed who Jesus was. And what did Jesus tell him? Today, you will be with me in heaven, in paradise. Did that thief come off that cross and get baptized and then go back up? Did he come off that cross and take church membership and get nailed back? He stayed on that cross. But Jesus said, today, you will be with me. Amen. Adding to the gospel is the same as taking away from it. Revelation chapter 22, verse 18. John, when he received this revelation of Jesus Christ, he said, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things... God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the Lamb's book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Listen. Satan will deceive us by all means possible. Amen? And they will appear convincing. They will appear, you know, uh, 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 righteous. They're, they will appear Bible-like, Christian-like. But as God's, God warns us, we have to be aware of the wiles of the devil. We have to be aware of his craftiness, his deceitfulness, plain and simple. We have to hold on tight to the simplicity that is in Jesus Christ. Amen. Christ plus nothing. It's that simple. Not only does Satan try to complicate the gospel, but he also tries to contradict the Bible and contradict the gospel. Let's go back to our original in 2 Corinthians 11. Let's look at verse 14. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus from whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which we have not received, or a different gospel which you have, have accepted, you may well put up with it. Verse 14. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Satan unequivocally hates the cross of Christ. Amen? We have to understand that. He absolutely hates Calvary's cross. Why? Not only does it declare God's love, his agape love, his unconditional love, his mercy and his grace, but it also declares Satan's defeat. Amen? That's why he despises it. Matthew 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and must be killed and be raised on the third day. Then Peter took Jesus aside and he began to rebuke Jesus, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Here we see that Satan temporarily deceived Peter. Peter wasn't seeing the, the spiritual truths that, that Jesus was trying to show them. Peter was deceived and he didn't see Jesus' necessity 
to go to Calvary. Amen? Jesus wasn't literally calling Peter Satan, but what he was saying was that, you know, he wanted Peter to know that his words, Lord, far be it from you, that's not going to happen. We're not going to let you go to the cross. Those very words were precisely what Satan wanted to happen. That's exactly what Satan was trying to keep from happening. Amen? In essence, there's really two basic religious uh, doctrines. Amen? Satan's do this and do that and earn your way into heaven, earn God's favor, or that of Christ. I've done all the work. Amen? Believe and live. It's that simple. Amen? That simple. The simplicity of the gospel of Christ. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Skip down to verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, those who are unsaved. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. No matter what your beliefs are, no matter what your opinion is about the cross, the facts remain the same. Amen? Even though Satan offered Jesus a crown without the cross. Do you remember when Satan took Jesus out into the desert? Forty days he hadn't eaten. He was fasting. And Satan took Jesus up on that high pinnacle and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and he said, if you just bow down to me, they're yours. What was Satan doing? He was offering Jesus the crown without what? Without having to go through the cross. Amen? Even though Satan offered that, Jesus had to go through the cross. Why? For us. For our sakes. It wasn't for his own. Amen. It wasn't for his own sake. It was for our sake and he had to go through the cross. Therefore, we must go by way of the cross as well. Amen. Jesus had to go through the cross for our sakes. That's why we have to go by way of the cross to receive his redemption, to receive his forgiveness and eternal life. Amen? It's that simple. What else has Satan tried to do? Satan also tries to, he tries to cause controversy among believers. Amen? Amen? Contentions. Go back to 2 Corinthians 11, our original text. Verse 15. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. Jesus warned us. He said this is what's going to happen. Satan has sown many tares among the wheat, hasn't he? 
And yet today we still lack surprise when we see it in the church. Jesus said, look, it's coming. It's, it's going to happen. There will be tares among the wheat, and Satan has sown tares among the wheat. Many false teachers, many false preachers have gone into many, many churches. And they are all masters of deception just like Satan is. Amen? They appear sincere. They appear righteous. They appear godly. But their goal is to cause division, to cause contentions. Or if they can just outright deceive the entire congregation, better yet. Amen? Better yet. They're going to use compelling arguments that, that sound biblical. James chapter 3, verse 14. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Satan is the author of divide and conquer. Amen? We have to understand that. He is the father of confusion. Jesus called him a liar and the father of it. He is the one who brings trouble and contentions into the church. And we have to recognize that. Amen? Now look at how the church ought to operate. Verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace catch that that's what the church ought to look like amen a christian should never fall into the into the category before that self-seeking set in their ways he says but the wisdom that is from above is peaceable gentle willing to yield full of mercy and good fruits and then he repeats it. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. In peace. In gentleness. Willing to yield. Full of mercy. You catch it? Jesus is the author of what? Peace. And the church ought to reflect that. Amen? Amen? I'm not saying we're going to have the same exact opinion on everything, but we ought to be willing to what? Yield to one another, right? Hear each other out. And in the end, come to an agreement. Plain and simple. But we do that in peace, in love, in mercy. What is the church's greatest weapon against division? Anybody know? What is our greatest weapon against division? It's forgiveness. Amen? Forgiveness. Greatest weapon. When we forgive, that's when Satan flees. When we forgive, that's when our ministries thrive. When we forgive, that is when God multiplies his blessings upon us. When we forgive, that's when Satan's plans are tossed right out the window and flat defeated. Amen? Forgiveness is God's greatest gift to us, and it's our greatest weapon against the adversary, against our enemy. That's why Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. 
for it's the peacemakers that shall what? Inherit the earth. Not Satan's kingdom, the earth, but when Jesus comes and he sets up his throne on the throne of David and he rules in righteousness. Amen? Plain and simple. They shall inherit the earth and become the children of God. The peacemakers. Why? Because that's when we act like Christ. That's when we become Christ-like. Our Lord is the author of peace. Let us be mindful of Satan's ploys, his craftiness, his deceitfulness, and let us just return to the simplicity that is in Jesus Christ. Amen.